<laughs> well, I will do it throughout. But uh, so yeah, I'm going to um, talk about this uh, bit of a uh, sort of convergence of uh, my interests or things I've done before, and I'm just going to discuss um, what I've been working on and talk about the process. Um, so. Yeah, so just going back into time here a little bit, uh, back in KISS 2013, uh, when I did the, um, the Wetware Fantasy, um, fantastically boring, I don't know if any of you were there, but yeah. So uh, anyway, then I discussed uh, in, in a talk pretty much how, uh, how that was accomplished. And I also had a, the token uh, Roads Not Taken slide. And uh, one of the things buried on that slide was um, in training of cortical rhythms uh, using low frequencies. And uh, so I'm finally getting around to that because uh, if you remember uh, Peter Bingham, the neurologist who presented last year in Oslo, I've been working with him, he's also interested in therapeutic entrainment. So these things kind of came together. And um, so, but beyond that, um, I just happened to be reading this book. Uh, I wasn't thinking about this conference or, you know, I just, I read Michael Pollan books and, you know, really interesting book. Uh, so, uh, Perhaps some of you have read it, but so buried in the section on how uh, how psychedelics work is uh, this uh, the, the work of uh, Robin Carhart Harris, who posits that um, that psychedelics, the way they, they they introduce energy into the system, enabling the flexibility necessary for change. So kind of you want you want change, and and there's the bit of a, a and the annealing metaphor is that's how annealing in nature works. You know, kind of heat something up, rearrange molecules, cool it down slowly, and then it might become a crystal, right? Um, so, so yeah. So I see this, and then of course um, I in Kiss 2012 uh, I talked about the, uh, the simulated annealing. Um, at that time, it was a script that I developed, um, and then uh, there was a piece. Uh, uh, Pandora's box, uh, Teresa Zurich performance, uh, and then um, so at the time again that was a script and uh, to do uh, this work I'm interested in now I had to create a tool version of it, um, and so just to kind of uh, put these things together, um, we have a bit of a kind of a strange uh, EEG neurofeedback loop, and. Uh, so I, I, this is better shown with the diagram, which I will show, but I just wanted to kind of state this, that what, uh, this question I have, well, what if a simulated annealing algorithm could be guided by energy from uh, brain waves and trained by rhythmic sounds? And then the entrainment can be enhanced or expedited some way by the auditory feedback from the algorithm. So, so neurofeedback is just a form of operant conditioning uh, where there's a, the participant gets feedback to help to learn to self-regulate their, in this case, their neurophysiology. Um, it's, it's done with the EEG, it's also done with fMRI, and you can sit there and, and see pictures and then see how things are going and kind of, you know, so it's not anything you know, new for sure. Um, and then here's kind of trying to uh, depict in a, a fairly simple way what's happening. Um, so, um, so I've got the simulated annealing tool running in Kima, and uh, then I've got this just simple sound auditory driving, six hertz. I'll talk a bit more about that later. Um, and then um, I'm taking the uh, uh, some 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 EEG energy of interest, and it's feeding back to the algorithm, and it's kind of guiding the algorithm. Um, so this is kind of the kind of the architecture, so to speak, whatever, um, and I'll, again, I'll provide more detail on that later. So, yeah, so first I want to just go back again because, um, just to kind of review the EEG thing as I did previously, just to get, uh, it's kind of interesting. So, uh, history, 1780, Galvani and Volta discussing the, uh, the dead frog leg and trying to, uh, you know, posit uh, explanations and, uh, and this is kind of the birth of electrophysiology, which is a good thing. And then just going, moving right ahead, uh, Richard Caton did some work with uh, dogs and apes measuring electro impulses directly from the brain surfaces of dogs and apes, uh, published in the British Medical Association. Um, and then based on that work, Hans Berger does some work with humans um, uh, measuring, this is really the first to measure EEG signals from a human brain. Um, at the, at the clinic, uh, the psychiatry clinic in, in Vienna, Germany. And, uh, but in interestingly, his motive 
uh, was uh, he, he wanted to understand the mechanism by which his sister seemed to have received his thoughts when he was in danger. So that's where he was with that. And so he asked the question, um, you know, could it be uh, telepathy? You know, <laughs> got the barbers from Pete. <laughs> yeah, got to have the coherence of these schema things, you know. So, uh, um, but actually, he eventually showed that, yeah, no, that really can't be because it's, you know, it's microvolts, and that's insufficient to explain, uh, you know, moving through a high re resistance conductor such as air. And so that case was kind of closed. But I'll talk more about that later. But. Um, but then, as a side effect, this is kind of how things go, right? He um, identified the, the um, alpha rhythm, and you know, around 10 hertz here, as shown, and that's actually a, a, a actual picture for he measured. He used his son to measure it. Um, so, um, and then, of course, that led to we have now the modern designations for all these these uh, these frequency bands that I'll, that I'll discuss. And so he kind of he, he initiated clinical encephalography, and you know, we use that today for. Uh, diagnosing, you know, epilepsy, sleep disorders, death, things like that. So, um, but um, as Carla mentioned in her talk about uh, sort of the fringes, so Berger, he used the chair of the psychiatry and neurology department, and um, he had to do this in secret. No one could know about it because he would be avoid, he'd be like associated with the occult, you know, so. <laughs> Interesting, you know, but he got some good stuff done uh, secretly. So, uh, so moving right along in history here, um, 1961, um, Andrew Dayer observes auditory driving response. So he uses drum sounds, three to eight hertz, and actually measures, uh, you know, uh, EEG energy that's that's correlating with 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 this auditory driving. And there's also a photic driving, which is uh, possibly more. It's more definitely more developed. That's just if you're seeing flashes, you can measure um, a, a response that you can notice, observe a response a response to. Um, flashes of light, things like that. So um, then quickly, just a little bit more stuff about EEG, that it's really it's electrical activity, but it's, um, it's changes in potential between reference points. So in the case of headset uh, that, that I'm using, it's the reference point here relative to the four other points. Um, and then in order to get a signal, you have to have like millions, of millions of neurons have to be activated synchronously to get uh, any kind of postsynaptic uh, potential. Uh, to detect it at the scale. Um, oops, sorry. And then uh, spatial resolution is, uh, is, is quite poor. So um, 10 square centimeters, uh, things are smooth. But the temporal, re temporal resolution is, is, is good. Um, just also just a reminder that it, it's, you're actually just getting like microvolts. Um, and this is passing through your dura, your, your, your cerebral spinal fluid, and skull, so by the time you get it out there. so. Um, and then as you get in deeper, you can get um, millivolts. Um, you can look at the data, time domain, frequency domain, um, and then there are other modalities, of course. Um, as I mentioned, you can use um, fMRI is um, better uh, spatial resolution, but poor time resolution. So there are uh, many studies that are done when you do both at once, if you're interested, uh, depending on the you know, interest. Um, then a quick uh, reality check here. So, right, the sensors, the signals that you're getting are really representing the activity um, uh, along the surface of the cortex. I'm showing it there. That is me, by the way, in case you're wondering. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't use anyone else's, so yeah. No. <laughs> uh, you can tell by the note, right? So, uh, so yeah, so each sensor, uh, millions of neurons, and then, of course, there's overlap. And then cognitive states are hard to define. Um, and then they generate excitatory and inhibitory uh, postsynaptic potentials. These are all issues. Source localization, of course, classic problem there, comes up a lot. And just bio signals are noisy, non stationary, and nonlinear. Um, just a few properties here that generally you can get higher frequencies. Um, uh, anteriorly, so up here, and then as you go back, you can get greater amplitude, which is kind of an interest when you're uh, looking for certain frequencies. Um, and then there is bilateral <coughs> asymmetry. Um, and then there's, of course, a bunch of artifacts too, uh, you know, blinking, eye movement, head movement, glossokinetics, you move your tongue. These are all, all these things generate artifacts. Um, 
Yeah, moving ahead. And then this is important too, that the amplitude is inversely proportional to the frequency. So it's actually a good source of control signals. Um, and then uh, I think Simon had a slide up about this too, <coughs> just summarizing the uh, frequency bands of interest. Uh, the delta, dreamless sleep, beta, hypnagogic, twilight thing, alpha, relaxation, beta, engaged. Um, and then these uh, uh, are, uh, appear in decreasing amplitude, as I mentioned. Um, and then of course also, while one band predominates, they're all always present. So. Um, Okay, so um, it's a good thing that there's more energy at lower frequencies, so entrainment there uh, is easier to detect. And then, of course, if you're interested in this stuff at all, I highly recommend this book. I mean, I got so many ideas for reading this. Um, it's just, even if you don't even want to do anything with GMO with this, it's an interesting book to read. Um, and some of the things that just that, that there's this characteristic of moving. Uh, from deep inside the thalamus, out of the cortex, that they're oscillators with mean frequencies, geometric progression, ratio of E. And this gives us this forever, uh, this, this, the oscillators will sort of vary forever, resulting in a non-repeating weekly chaotic pattern of consciousness. Right? Um, and then also neurons are relaxation oscillators, so they're uh, nonlinear oscillators with a long relaxation period during which the system approaches a sort of equilibrium point. And then there's a short impulse, impulsive period, and the equilibrium point shifts, a flip, you know, to um, bring current events into this. Yeah. Um, and then uh, uh, stochastic resonance is an important idea, too, uh, that the actual noise can help move weak signals above thresholds of interest. Um, and so, yeah, so maybe it's not the connectivity per se, but the temporal organization of activity through the synchrony that matters as far as consciousness goes. Um, and also, um, there's, uh, there's scale invariance. Uh, you, can, you can measure a pattern from a small portion of the cortex, and it looks like a pattern from the whole. So, wow, fractals, that's great. You know? So I got to use the uh, little image for this conference, too, there, right? Yeah. Um, so, okay, so back to just entrainment. Um, so, uh, the Dutch physicist Christian Perpens, uh, you may know about the... the um, has the pendulum, pendulum clocks, the collection of pendulum clocks, like on a piece of wood, and over time they, they all kind of get in sync. You know? So he was the first to sort of investigate that. Um, and then it's, of course, two or more independent oscillators influencing each other mutually. Um, and then uh, the degree of influence depends on the coupling force of some sort. Uh, it's also known as a, like a steady state of a potential. Um, in other words, instead of one event occurs, you see this potential, it's just continuous, based on this continuous uh, stimulation. Um, and, you know, maybe it's, maybe it's how, why we enjoy music. I mean, maybe music is just, uh, you know, external oscillators driving our internal oscillators. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, as far as the basics of, of entrainment, um, the method, simple methods, you can either use percussive sounds, as was done in, you know, 1960s by Nair, um, you can use acoustic beating, just regular beating. We play out the speakers, say, 200 and, and 210, as Simon was talking about. And then um, you could also use binaural beating, the two frequencies in each ear independently, and then your wetware creates that, you know, other beating. It's less predominant, though, for sure. I did a lot of experiments using chemo, just kind of try these different things, and it's the, the acoustic beating is much more predominant, you know. I, but, so I ended up using that because I don't want to go into too many different areas of slightly esoteric things, so we're going to keep it simple. So, um, uh, but it actually ended up starting just using percussive sounds. Um, and then, of course, low pitch sounds at the low, low end of the auditory uh, uh, scale that we can perceive, right, down, down the beta gamma, gamma range. Um, so, yeah, trying to keep it simple because there's a lot going on here, as you can see in that, that, that diagram. <laughs> um, okay, so kind of uh, looking at the literature, um, so yeah, there were studies showing that you know you can um, neurons can entrain to a beat and they can even entrain to a meter. Okay, so you get like subharmonics. So if there's an eight hertz stimulus, you're it, it, you're going to see something eight hertz, four hertz, two hertz, one hertz, down like that, which is interesting. You know, and of course I, I read all stuff. I, I try these things on myself. You know, because it's uh, it's kind of uh, if you can, it's an interesting thing to do. You know, I mean, but though sometimes it takes quite a while. Sometimes it takes like you'll see in the literature it might take like 10, 12 minutes to get there. 
right? But it's really cool when you're doing, you're trying this and you see the little spectral line pops up, you know? It's like, wow, it works, you know? <laughs> and then it lingers a little, you know? <laughs> um, so, then uh, just, uh, I had to say this because of the Ken and Barbie again, uh, they're uh, brain to brain entrainment, people look at this, I mean, you know, this is like, it's not like some, you know, it's like they're looking at the results here that brain oscillators are, are synchronized between a listener and speaker during an oral narrative. So, you know, you, you could be synchronizing with me now or not. <laughs> yeah. So, um, and of course, this is a sort of less interesting and eloquent uh, uh, presentation of this because Carla Carl already talked about this, you know, I mean, for this conference, I had to go look at the uh, psychobiology of altered states of consciousness, right? I mean, you got you to read that before you do anything get right, you know. So there's a nice little table summarizing altered states, um, and I just kind of, you know, boxed out what kind of looking at, you know, at a high level. Um, so, the, um, I mean, so the big questions are, you know, can we change this default, net mode, default mode network, which is ordinary waking consciousness um, with entrainment? Um, and then, you know, is consciousness an important property of synchronized networks? You know, it's possible, you know. Um, I don't know how you upload that, by the way. Um, anyway, <laughs> and then, you know, how does mind arise from brain and um, do the fundamental cognitive processes arise from this synchronous activity? Um, uh, you can see in the literature that we've already identified that certain, like, memory encoding and retrieval are related to theta and gamma rhythms, you know, and people think about this whole, you know, that whole seven plus or minus two things you can remember. People equate that with rhythms, you know, it's kind of interesting stuff, you know, a lot of stuff to get distracted with when you look at this. <laughs> so, um, and then quickly I want to review uh, simulated annealing, because um, I know everybody doesn't come to every conference. So, um, so yeah, this is uh, just one slide from the other presentation that Simulated, uh, simulated annealing is a probabilistic algorithm, a search algorithm, basically, to find a, a less than optimal solution. Um, it's, a, it's a generate and test algorithm, and then does have this property to avoid uh, local minima, whereby you would sometimes explore something that would be slightly worse, you know? And then as, as the thing evolves over time, it's less likely to do that as it kind of cools down. So it's hot at the beginning, it's looking at a lot of alternatives, then it kind of cools down, it's, it's looking at less. And that's just kind of just a really high level, just a pseudo code for that, what we're doing here. Um, let's have an initial pitch set, temperature, you're decreasing the temperature, you play the pitch set, you generate something new, you test a new one, maybe you take it, maybe you don't. You know? So that's just kind of the most abstract way of that. You can look at the code in the tool if you want to you know, see the details of that. Um, but that's kind of what's going on there. So this is back to what I actually tried doing, which was, um, this is really a, a small question, I just wanted to investigate the initial goal was just to explore uptraining of uh, frontal theta, right? And uh, got that looking at this paper. Um, this, this, these are all, there's a series of these. There's like three of them that are all really interesting. Um, so it's, uh, so it's, again, theta is the is, is sort of an index of hypnogogia. So uh, kind of interesting state, right? And so now into what maybe people might be interested in, which is the implementation. Um, so this is the old uh, implementation I did, uh, uh, and it was much more complicated as far as like, well, you know, I had to get their proprietary, their, their dongle, their protocol, and then their API, and then write something that listens to that, and then sends that OSC, you know, so I'm glad that's in the spider web, you know, so um, this is what I'm doing now. <laughs> yeah. So it's just the just the Muse EG headset, and then I'm using, uh, there's an iOS, on well, iOS, um, you, there's an API, or you can, there's an existing thing called Muse Monitor, which is great. I started out doing my own thing, and then I found uh, Muse Monitor, which is great, and just send out OSC, the Paparana. Um, and then that, uh, that headset um, has got uh, just four channels. And there they are, using the, the standard way that this is uh, illustrated. Um, and so it's, it's you know, back here under rubber, and then you can see the center's here, and then the, the reference is, is right up front here. Um, <coughs> So just a little bit quickly about use monitor. So it's good when you're doing these kind of things, of course, to just look at the data, right? Which is great. And so these, you can see the data uh, for these four different views of the data. I just want to give you a quick, uh, just kind of show you what it looks like. So here, um, oh, sorry. So yeah, it doesn't show on mine. Okay, anyway, uh, those are the bands. And, and in real time, you can look at that just with your headset and sit there and just look at that energy in real time. You can see it's uh, 
inversely proportional to frequency, right? There's almost there's more, generally more energy in the delta band. Uh, so yeah, that, that, that's useful. And then, um, and this is just a straight up um, raw, if you like look at raw and ECD and like, you know, count how many cycles you see in a second there, you do that. Um, and discrete frequency. Um, so again, you can see that the pink noise pattern, right? More energy, low frequencies. And you can use the um, spectrogram as well. So, um, okay, and then just with moving right along the implementation. So, what you see when the OSC comes in uh, in Kima is um, I'm just taking a look right here. I have, I have uh, circled just the um, energy in the theta band, right? And then you get uh, four values which uh, map to the sensors. And this data is coming in, and you get a lot of stuff you might not want. You get all the raw EEG data, whether the head move, accelerometer, you know, gyro stuff, it's all there. And you just take out what you want, but this, is, this data is kind of coming in um, uh, 256 hertz, so it comes in, you know, more often than you need, especially when you're looking at these, these bands, these frequency bands of interest, which are moving, things are moving slowly, mm -hmm. right? Um, so I thought I'd just start with a um, simple, to, to do the implementation, just something simple, simple stimuli that, that um, attempt, and then attempt to reduce, reproduce the simple results using things more interesting, but the example I'm going to play is really quite simple, just to kind of give you an idea of what's going on here. So yeah, back to this slide again, just that a uh, little more detail. So it's the theta energy coming, I'm look, only looking at theta energy from the headset, and then there's a 6 hertz strum loop coming out, um, just real simple sounds. Um, and then uh, here is just, uh, so the tool is, is uh, controlling uh, event values in the multi-grid, and there are the, on the left the four voices, the drum loop, and then just EEG input. And then quickly here is the uh, simulated annealing tool. Um, talk about, so basically what you can do here is you can use this for anything, it, it, you know, different time scales. You can use it, run it for days or seconds. And then you have the, um, you have the initial frequencies. And then uh, as it evolves, you can watch them change. If you see on the right, the temperature, that's just showing you like as a thing is evolving and it cools down, it's less likely to explore something new. Right, um, and you, hopefully it will converge where you want it to converge by the time it's done. So the important parameters are that that time offset increment. Uh, so right, if it's if it's 0.1, that's just a tenth of a second, so it won't run for very long. So you want to set that to like maybe 0.01 or 001, and if things move slowly, you're more likely to find a optimal or a near opt near optimal solution. Uh, and then the temperature, how how much you lower the temperature uh, through each iteration, and then the um, Min sense to perturb and max sense to perturb. So when it has a, a, a candidate set, it perturbs within that range. So for what I'm doing right here, I kind of you keep a kind of a small range, but you can do things with, and let it explore and have a large range. And you know, I guess, again, you're listening to the exploration uh, when you're using this tool. You're, you're not looking for some endpoint. There's been I've seen a lot of work on using simulated annealing to create peace, and then you get this peace when you're done. Well, this is all about like. The, you know, the experience, the journey, right? So, um, and again, this can evolve however you like, and it's, it's really fun to play with. Uh, but I just used it here for, if you see that uh, reference frequency, what you can do is you can um, have it set, or you can say listen, and when you say listen, it's, um, it's connected with an event variable um, that's coming in from, in this case, the EEG, and it's listening to that, and that's kind of driving where they're going, you know? So, um, yeah? I'm sorry, but what, what do you mean by annealing? Oh sure, okay, yeah. So it's um, yeah, it's it's in a, it's a process in, in nature. Like it's it's very old. It's it's when they used to heat the ancients used to like heat metals up, and they figured out that like if you heat the metal up, and then when you let it cool, it it'll it'll come into like a different state, uh, a more preferred state. Like a phase change. Then, yeah, yeah. I mean, but you're we, well when it does a phase change, you're getting better results. Mm. You might get something crystallized. Like like making steel. Uh yeah. Well, they uh, copper was the first thing I think okay. they used it for. Thank yeah. You. And the Neolithic time or something like that. And then in the 80s, I should give, in the 80s, somebody got the idea, wait a minute, let's use this uh, uh, as an algorithm. You know, let's do simulated annealing. You know, let's take that inspiration from nature and uh, find a way to use it to solve like real search problems. You know? So when you say temperature. Yeah. So temperature means like uh, it's, it's you, when you inject heat into it, you get higher entropy, right? 
And so as the temperature lowers in the, simulated, in the simulation version, it's, it's cooler, less entropy, and then but in the, the way it's interpreted in this algorithm is to just uh, take stop taking solutions, stop trying to take things that, that, that are different from where you are. You know, just kind of, kind of stay, you know. So the, uh, the idea is that it would converge, right? Uh, and again, you, do, you have a thing run in a second, or you can have it run in a day. You know, um, so again, what your musical interest might be, you know. So yeah, it's fun to play with. Um, so I think all the parameters in there, yeah. Uh, uh, I don't like. I usually use six six six, but I don't know. <laughs> so, anyway, um, so there's the EEG interface, um, and the green blocks are um, uh, just image, uh, images. Uh, it's just as, as Jeff was talking about. I index into. Um, I get I get a signal from the headset about how good the quality of the connection is. And I just use those blocks. Because when you're sitting there looking at it, you really want to know like, if, if you don't have a good connection, all that's meaningless. You know? so, um, and then just uh, the um, important thing is that uh, beta front average, is uh, that's in bells. And that's actually what I'm using to, to, guide, the, to guide the algorithm. Um, and I have here the, um, so this right here is, uh, not exactly theoretically based. Um, I'm just trying to make the, uh, the the intuition is that I want that to be inversely proportional to the the, the offset to the frequency. So and it's in bells, so I'm just using it yeah, as an exponent there. You know. So um, and that's continuously read by the tool. But I mean, you know, you know, I don't know if I've got that right. I mean, was to do that, but it's just trying to just at the high level get get it to be inversely proportional. Um, Okay, so a quick little demo of all this running together. Um, so, so there's that, just a simple six hertz thing going on, all right? And then the, um, then the so it starts running. So it just sort of it goes on, and then it kind of um, it becomes more constant as the theta energy goes up. You have to trust me on that. Yeah, <laughs> only well, sit through that. But um, but like I said, there, there are many. This is my first trial. There are many ways to do this. You know, you, you can drive it different ways to have use different parameters. And um, yes, if theta energy is controlling temperature. It is. Uh, no, sorry. No, it's controlling that reference free the offset from the reference frequency. So in other words, it's going to wander around more if your theta is lower. And then if your theta comes up, it wanders around less. And then at the very end, um, you know, they, they just, it stays there and it just becomes constant. You know? But it's very sensitive to the parameters as far as the rate at which these things you know, move around. Yeah. Um, and then so let's, um, <laughs> um, this is just, again, as I mentioned, uh, Dr. Peter Bingham I've been working with, um, we're just talking about uh, different therapeutic directions. Like, I mean, especially epilepsy, I mean, it's, it's the, I don't know if you know stuff, but you know, a, um, a seizure is synchrony. Is all everything synchronous, right? We have these weekly chaotic things going on, but a seizure is synchronous, and they there is some work on um, possibly um, if you can if you can modulate you know uh, brainwave energy, you, you could possibly um, in some way positively affect uh, that that you would go into a seizure, you know, because there are there are people who have fairly frequently things, and there is being some work done where you could um, possibly um, affect that by uh, entrainment. Yeah. So, um, and then also separate from that um, is, uh, you know, I might do another piece uh, or a fantasy number two or something like that, you know, like the old thing, the wonder, you know. <laughs> um, if you're interested in this stuff, that's just, uh, you know, some things <coughs> to, to, to read. Um, uh, so yeah, I need a couple minutes for questions, any questions? Um, I, I was unclear when you said that the drum pattern was six hertz. Yeah. What was that actually referring to? Uh, it's just the, 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 the beats per minute, right? You know? One, two, three, four, five. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
Okay. Yeah. So it was, it was six. It was. It sounded like it was six eight. But how did? But what was the tempo and how did that that relate? I'm still a little unclear. Um, so six cycles per second. Yeah. 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 So you can't like like you could use a you could use a it's not audible so you couldn't use a, a tone for that. Line frequencies they stack them sometimes to sort of get an alpha state and then maybe inject a little bit of gamma for a short period. Oh yeah. And no. There are yeah. other, you know, it, it goes a lot more complex. Than Definitely. That. No, I'm just trying to keep it really simple. Yeah. Yeah. The KISS principle, right? <laughs> <laughs> yes? I was wondering uh, if you could use, um, like, higher octaves of 6 hertz. Like yeah. Um, yeah, no, that's a good question, too. I, you know, that might, with the subharmonics, as I mentioned. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't know if that could work as well or not as well. I just haven't like done like a, enough experimenting, or you know, you'd have to do a study to identify those kind of things, right? Too. You know? And if it's more also, you know, if it's more musically interesting, does that how does that affect like the actual entrainment, right? So yeah, I wasted lots of time doing stuff on myself, by the way, trying to help understand this. Yeah. <laughs> I see it. Yeah. Yes. Uh, do you find the um. Uh, four sensors on the Muse to be uh, adequate as opposed to like the 14 or whatever on the... Uh, yeah, well the one issue, yeah, uh, the one issue would be uh, on the emo. if you got 14, you're getting stuff in the occipital area. And if you're doing something where you've discovered whatever by looking through the literature, that that's what you're interested in, you know, you can't use the Muse, you know. Yeah, well, it, seems it, it, easier, yeah. it seems a lot easier to use too, right? Than, oh, yeah. Yeah, but there. To be fair, I don't know. I'm kept up on like Emo latest stuff. I'm sure they have an app too, and you know, it's just the thing I didn't like about Emo though was the wet sensors. Like they have to have just the right amount of sailing, or you don't get a good yeah. signal. And then you're do... too late when I got it. <laughs> I was like, uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, you're doing a performance. You're like, oh man, I gotta get the sailing right. It's like, oh. so, yeah. Um, a really basic, pragmatic question: How do you build that temperature? Ah, uh, yeah, it's um, it's actually in the in the tool in the code in the tool. There's a variable as it loops through, and then that's mapped to that. Uh, oh, oh, sorry, it's, it's, that is only in the tool GUI. It's not in the BCF. Right? Yeah. So it's like, oh, I haven't seen that before. Yeah, it's an old, it's, it's, an old it's an old small talk thing. That's, yeah, right. right. <laughs> I didn't get out. And so when you do a tool, you've got those. <laughs> yeah. Did you put up the reference slide for another? Oh time? yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Do you need a fitness function? Excuse me? Yeah, I do have a fitness function, yeah. And, it's, and so you can look at it. And it's, but yeah, the fitness function is actually, it's looking, if you have it selected to consonants, the fitness function is uh, ratios of small integers. Like it likes, you know, 2 to 1, 3 to 2, 4 to 3, 5 to 4. It's looking for that. And, and, and it's, it's kind of uh, microtonally searching for that, right? It, it could not be that like internally, but right now it does that. Or if, if you switch dis dissonance, you just, you know, you get, you get some good dissonance, you know. So if you're a person who values that more, you just, you know, pay what you're doing. Yeah. So, Carl, yes. When you were experimenting with the news, could you help, could you um, intentionally change the rhythms? Um, yeah, I did. It takes a long time. It, it takes, um, yeah, and that's the other question too, is like, well, this entrainment, I, I mean, it's kind of boring just to do entrainment, so that's why I got to say about shaking things up and you know, kind of bringing them together, but, you know, that's actually with uh, Dr. Bingham, I'll probably be doing more of that kind of just straight up entrainment stuff, but yeah, no, I could, yeah, you can look at the, it's, it's, you can look at the spectrogram, and, um, but it takes like 10 minutes, and then certain frequencies are really hard on you, I mean, I don't like doing the, you, there's a thing at 40 hertz you can get, you know, that's like, you know, like good. <laughs> yeah. it's the wrong kind of ultra consciousness, you know. <laughs> you know? <laughs> so, um, it's great. Anything else? Yeah. Good. Okay.